Hello and welcome to another episode of Full Court Finance here at Saks. I'm your host, Ben Rains. And today we're taking a look at three large cap stocks from three different key industries to consider buying before their upcoming earnings results and possibly holding for a long time. And those three stocks we're looking at today are Visa, Union Pacific, and DR Horton. But before we get into everything, remember to subscribe and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcast. And make sure to check out our zax.com slash promo page for a look in some of our services, portfolios, and more. So before we jump into these three stocks, it's worth kind of just going over where the market stands at the moment and then kind of the broader earnings overview, uh, just heading into the busy, busy part of earnings season. So there's little doubt that Wall Street remains pretty certain that the Fed's going to cut rates in 2024, but investors are getting a bit more nervous that the Fed and some other influential central banks won't race to dramatically cut rates uh, while inflation lingers solidly above target levels. On the other hand, though, the selling heading into the heart of fourth quarter, fourth quarter earnings season that we saw earlier this week uh, kind of makes sense to help cool things down following that blistering run off the October lows. That said, I'm recording this Thursday afternoon, and the NASDAQ and the S&P 500 were both bouncing uh, so in the green uh, as of Thursday afternoon. So the S&P 500 was trying to get right back above that 21-day moving average uh, for the second time this year, so sitting at about neutral RSI levels as well. So there is little doubt that the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ are likely to test those longer-term 50-day and 200-day moving averages at some point in the early months of 2024. So we'll kind of see where that goes, but investors – even during bullish runs, you need to remember that stocks never go straight up. So the selling is not a scary thing. So taking a look at the broader earnings picture, uh, the key for earnings outlook has actually improved slightly since the big banks kicked off things late last week. Uh, the earnings outlook is down from where it was uh, back in October. But as I said, it's improving recently. So we're calling for about 0.2%. Uh, overall earnings growth for the S&P 500, this is based on the most recent Zacks data on about 2.2% revenue growth. This would follow 3.8% uh, earnings growth last quarter. And then we're calling for a big bounce back heading into the first quarter. So first quarter, we're calling for about 4.6% earnings growth and then a big comeback in 2024. So overall, we're calling for about 11.4% earnings growth in 2024 after an expected decline of 3.5% in 2023, and then another 12.4% earnings growth next year. So if the results are able to show, or if the guidance people provide or companies provide in the next couple of weeks holds up pretty well for Q1, that's a that's a really positive sign. Uh, so investors, obviously, though, who can handle some of the near-term uncertainty that earnings season brings might want to consider buying these three large cap stocks we're going to dive into today and possibly holding for the long haul, obviously buying anything just for an earnings release bump uh, is not necessarily advisable, uh, but these three stocks are going to all report in the next couple of weeks, and they might see some pullbacks. They might bounce in the near term, depending on how the results hold out. But as I said, these are longer term plays uh, to consider as they are set to report their earnings results in the coming weeks. So Visa is the first stock on the list. Uh, it trades in a ticker just V. And it reports its Q1 2024 results, so not its fourth quarter results, on January 25th. Visa uh, is a company that might be sitting in some of your wallets right now or on your phone. It's that credit card powerhouse that remains really more influential than ever in the U.S. and around the world, despite all of those quote-unquote fintech disruptors. The company operates an extensive and powerful payment processing and back-end network uh, and it takes a piece of those really nearly endless number of credit card payments in a world that's growing more and more cashless every day. Visa's constant and never-ending role in the economy shows up in its really consistent and impressive expansion. The company beat our earnings and revenue estimates, has beat our earnings estimates every quarter over the last five years, including a solid beat last quarter as its travel business continues to rebound. So for the full year 2023, uh, its payment volume was up 9%. Its cross-border volume, excluding intra-Europe, was up 25%. Its cross-border volume overall was up 20%. And its uh, process transactions were up 10%. So overall, just continued strength. And if we look ahead, we're calling for about 9.5% revenue growth this year and then another 10% revenue growth next year to get all the way up to nearly $40 billion. And on the bottom line, 
we're calling for about 13% adjusted earnings growth this year and then another 13% adjusted earnings growth next year. So just consistency from Visa on both the top and bottom line. And on the revenue front, this comes after it did uh, really big growth the last several years as well. So as I said, it's kind of hard to stress just how uh, consistent Visa is and it just is a part of the economy even though all these fintech companies have tried to make their way in visa is doing uh, a really good job at maintaining its position and kind of transitioning with the times as well to beyond just physical credit cards and get into that digital payment business as well the company currently lands a zach's ranking number three hold but its overall earnings outlook has trended slightly higher uh overall its shares are up about 380 percent in the last 10 years to blow away the broader zach's tech sector because we can consider this kind of a tech stock more than just a, a banking stock or finance stock, which is up 260%. It's also up over 2,000% during the past 15 years to blow away tech and the S&P 500. Visa has come back to the pack a little bit during the last three years, but it's still up 33%. And it actually hit brand new highs as I'm recording this on Thursday afternoon. As Wall Street's clearly looking to that consistent growth in its solid outlook. Obviously, the, the company could face or the stock could face a near term pullback. Uh, it's sitting at some pretty overheated RSI levels on a 10 year time frame, uh, trading solidly above its 21 week moving average. So it's going to come back to these longer term averages eventually. But overall, as I said, trying to time it exactly isn't worth it if you're in this stock for the long haul. It's trading above its 21 day moving average as well, as I said, at brand new 52 week highs and all time highs. And pretty heavily overbought in terms of RSI levels on the this one year time frame as well. That said, though, it's currently trading at around six percent discount to its average X price target, and it's still trading thirty one percent below its peaks in terms of its forward earnings. So it's trading at twenty five point nine times forward twelve month earnings, uh, and right at its decade long median, and nearly right in line with tech despite that longer term outperformance. So the digital payment company, as I said, it's, it's more embedded in the economy than ever before, and the economy is growing more cashless by the day. It also has a really solid balance sheet, and Wall Street's really high in the stock overall. So if you're considering Visa uh, as a near-term play, obviously it could face some pullbacks. As I said, it's a little overheated, but it's certainly a stock worth considering as a longer-term investment as part of a diversified portfolio. And uh, another stock we're going to look at today is Union Pacific, which trades in the ticker UNP. The company reports its fourth quarter 2023 earnings results on January 25th. Union Pacific is a rail freight powerhouse and one of the most kind of logical long-term plays in a wider world of transportation infrastructure. The company links over 20 states in the western two-thirds of the U.S., helping serve many of the fastest-growing cities in the country. The company also connects Canada's rail system as well, and it's the, quote, only railroad serving all six major Mexico gateways. Union Pacific started to run far fewer trains with far more cars long before the pandemic. Uh, and it's kind of transformed through a process known as precision scheduling railroading. So that's focused on just being as efficient as possible, focused on the bottom line as well. It already operates some of the longest runs in the US and its management is confident that it can one day produce the lowest ratio of expenses to revenue in the industry. It obviously has been dealing with some longer or more near-term headwinds in terms of inflation's hurting, manufacturing. There's just been a slowing of the economy in general since that big COVID boom. We should note that the company hired a new CEO last year after a big activist investor push. So looking to its top and bottom line, we're calling for about a 3% revenue decline this year. So the, the year it's just about to report. So this is now kind of already in the rear view. And we're calling for then a big uh, 4% boost uh, next year to get above last year's levels. And then we're calling for a roughly 9% decline in 2023, the, the year it's about to report, and then to bounce back 9% next year in 2024. So that's a good sign. We should also note that the company has paid a dividend for over 120 years in a row. Uh, it's uh, raised its payout by about 10% annualized over the last five years, and it's currently yielding about 2.2% at the moment. It's also buying back a lot more stock. That was kind of a part of its activist investor push just to return more value to shareholders. And its commitment to efficiency and modernization also includes uh, focus on 
just various new technologies, cleaner technologies, and <clears throat> I look to a future uh, with far more, far more fuel efficiency. And as people across the economy are looking for more in the most fuel efficient ways to transport goods, railroads are some of the best ways to do that and far more efficient than trucks. So overall, the stock is up about uh, over nearly 1,400% over the last 20 years. This blows away the wider Zach's transportation sector, which is up just 230% during that time. Uh, this also blows away the S&P 500, which is, which is up about 320% uh, during this period. The stock over the last five years is up about 50%, which lags the S&P 500, which is up about 80%. And it's kind of moved sideways over the last several years, and it's trading roughly 15% below its highs. Yet at the moment, it is trading above um, its 21-week moving average in somewhat near uh, overbought RSI levels on this longer-term 10-year time frame. But if we go to a shorter time frame over the last year, the stock is now back below its 21-day moving average and possibly testing its 50-day in the near term. And it's gone from pretty heavily overbought RSI levels in December, well below neutral at the moment. Uh, then valuation-wise, it trades about 10% below its highs uh, over the last 10 years. So that's a solid sign. Overall, Union Pacific is a titan of an industry that's not going out of style anytime soon. And it remains probably crucial for decades and decades to come. Overall, Union Pacific lends a Zach's rank number three hold at the moment. And... 12 of the 30 brokerage recommendations or 28 brokerage recommendations that Zax has are sitting as strong buys with two buys and then eight holds. So no sells in there at all. So Union Pacific certainly a stock worth considering as part of a diversified longer term portfolio. And the last stock we're looking at today is DR Horton, which trades in the ticker DHI. The company is set to report its Q1 2024, so the first quarter of fiscal 2024. Its results on January 23rd. It is one of America's largest home builders, and it is currently in operation across nearly 120 markets in 33 states. The company operates a pretty diverse portfolio of brands that include its namesake, as well as others. Its various brands cater to different buyers at different stages of their lives and income brackets. Uh, breaks down its offerings into first-time buyers, quality and value, adult, active, and luxury. And its prices in general range from about two hundred thousand dollars to a million. On top of that, uh, and it's on top of that, it's single and multifamily rental property business. It it operates that, and unlike some other builders, it offers various uh, subsidiary subsidiaries, excuse me, including mortgage financing, title services, insurance services, things like that. The company has been on a booming tear over the last decade. It did twenty one percent. Revenue growth last year, 37% growth the year before that, 16% growth before that. So just booming sales in the last year. So during its fiscal 2023, the company completed uh, what it called its 22nd consecutive year as the largest home builder in the U.S. with a record 89,000, roughly 89,000 homes closed. Uh, and then in the fourth quarter, its orders increased 39% to about 19,000 homes Uh and 34% in value at about $7.3 billion. So that's a really positive sign. And then overall, uh, its longer-term outlook remains really intact since millennials are now driving the housing market and baby boomers are finally retiring and moving. Plus, home builders didn't overbuild during the COVID boom, which means there's still plenty of upside. And a lot of people who locked in lower interest rates have no interest in moving anytime soon, so that is going to require new homes to meet the demand. We should note that mortgage rates, as of recording this on Thursday, fell to their lowest level since May. So the average 30-year fixed-rate mortgage hit uh, about 6.6%, which is a positive sign in terms for the housing market. And it's obviously well above its its lows from that that COVID area COVID era, excuse me, when it, we got below 3% from 30-year mortgage rates, but. Uh, anything above the highs is a positive sign, and as interest rates trend lower, there's just going to be more people heading back into the housing market. And we should note that many people say the housing recession kind of already happened, 
and DR Horton and many of these home builders are in a good position to grow, as I said, over the long haul. So if we look at 2024 and 2025, this is coming up against, I said, big years of growth. We're calling for another 3% growth this year and then another 7% growth next year on the revenue side, and then 2% growth on the bottom line this year, and then another 9% growth next year against those whopping and really difficult to compete against years for DR Horton. And better yet, on the bottom line, we're seeing some positive earnings revisions activity heading into its upcoming earnings release with some upbeat guide or upbeat, uh, as I said, yeah, analysts revisions as its most accurate, most recent estimates for all of the periods, especially 2024 and 2025. So those are coming in above expectations, which is a good sign. And the company boasts a really impressive history of bottom line beats, including an average beat of about 29% in the trailing four quarters in its overall uh, its home building industry, which is the wider Zach's building products slash home builders industry, sits in the top 5% of over 240 Zach's industries. And the stock's up about 630% in the last 10 years, blow away the S&P 500. And then over the last 25 years, the stock is up about 2,500% versus the S&P 500, which is up about 340%. So been on a really long, impressive run. Obviously, there was a uh, downturn thrown in there, as with the wider market. And then over the last year, DHI, so that's DR Horton stock, is up 66% versus the broader construction market, which is up about 40%. It recently found support at its 21-day moving average, and it's trading near its all-time highs and it's actually a positive sign. It got super overheated in the middle of December, way above overbought RSI levels. And now it's trending back down closer to neutral, which is a positive sign. And then on the valuation front, it trades at a 33% discount to its highs at just 10.5 times forward 12-month earnings, which is actually a significant discount to the broader construction market as well. Uh, the company also buys back its stock and it pays a dividend. It's yielding about 0.8% right now. So with all these stocks, you have to consider if you want to possibly wait for a pullback. But as I said, if you're a longer term investor, trying to play the exact market timing game is never easy. So all three of these names are certainly worth putting on your watch list to consider buying in 2024. And take a look at kind of how their earnings results come in in the next couple of weeks and then assess from there. So that does it for this episode of Full Court Finance. Until next time, I'm your host, Ben Rains. And remember, if you have any questions, please feel free to shoot us an email over at podcast at zax.com. This material is being provided for informational purposes only, and nothing herein constitutes investment, legal, accounting, or tax advice, or a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold a security. Do not act or rely upon the information and advice given in this podcast without seeking the services of competent and professional legal, tax, or accounting counsel. Publication and distribution of this podcast is not intended to create, and the information contained herein does not constitute an attorney-client relationship. No recommendation or advice is being given as to whether any investment or strategy is suitable for a particular investor. It should not be assumed that any investments in securities, companies, sectors, or markets identify and described were or will be profitable. All information is current as of the date herein and is subject to change without notice. Any views or opinions expressed may not reflect those of Zach's investment research as a whole.